Gold continues to surge, setting another all-time high just today. But why? Now, gold is a warning about something. It isn't money anymore, so its primary use is as a financial hedge, and a financial hedge against some of the biggest dangers out there. Now, there have been three general explanations that have been offered for this golden surge. And we're going to go over all three of them to see what the evidence tells us. When there is something lighting a fire under gold, it's definitely worth the additional scrutiny, something we should pay attention to, especially since other commodities, key commodities such as silver, aren't following along. But before we step into the golden world one more time, I do want to remind you, Euro Dollar University Spring Sale is still ongoing. You get a free month membership or a free month daily briefing. Your first month is on us. You can cancel any time in the first 30 days, no risk to you. We've got special annual rates on both of those as well. Huge savings on also our deep dive analysis, especially when you bundle all three of these together. We've got great deals on all of these packages. Check it out. All the information is available at our website, which is eurodollar.university. The first explanation we have for gold is actually kind of two put together. They relate to the Chinese and China's situation. On the one hand, China's economy, real estate sector, we've gone over that, not good. And on the other is the potential reaction to it. There have been rumors circulating, especially this past weekend, that maybe authorities in Beijing are about to ramp up the money printer. They're gonna tell the PBOC to start buying central government bonds which is sort of like a QE. And in many people's mind, QE is inflationary or potentially inflationary. Therefore, China is going to undertake vastly accommodative monetary policies, which would be gold positive. Now, of course, we know QE is not inflationary. It isn't the case at all. But this is one of the explanations you continue to hear, that even if it isn't this bond buying scheme, which it doesn't seem to be, the, the, what Xi said is being overblown, there is the potential that at some point, if the situation continues to deteriorate as it has, that eventually China's authorities will have to do something. If it isn't bond buying, that may be something else. Now, the problem with this theory is that China's central bank has already been doing quite a bit already. We've talked about this before. The PBOC has been printing RMB for quite some time, really going back to last fall. And the most recent statistics on the PBOC's balance sheet, which are for the month of February, are kind of mixed. Now, that could just be the calendar skew. There is less of an increase in bank reserves than there had been in the past. And we'll see what the March numbers look like in a couple weeks. But as far as this idea that gold is surging because of the money printing that's going to be unleashed in China... The PBOC has already introduced massive amounts of liquidity, at least as most people would consider it. And yet, the key part where it comes to economy and inflation, the banking system is behaving more and more deflationary. So even though Xi might have mentioned that he would like more liquidity and maybe some bond buying from the PBOC, that's not necessarily a money printing hyperinflationary scenario. In fact, it's just an encouragement in my mind to continue to do more of the same. And the reason why Beijing might continue to make continue on this more patient path, some recent economic statistics make it seem like the Chinese economy could be stabilizing here. I mentioned before the previous month's big three accounts, that's retail sales, industrial production, and fixed asset investment. Now, while they were still ugly, they were better than had been expected, which some people can take as China's economy turning a corner, becoming more positive. Just last night, the Chinese reported on their PMI, which were quite a bit better than they have been recently. In fact, the National Bureau of Statistics manufacturing PMI hit its highest level since the reopening euphoria last year, which is a warning. But at the same time, if you're in the government in Beijing, you can point to these PMIs and the uptick in them. You can point to the better than expected, those still ugly results in retail sales and fixed asset investment, industrial production and say, what we're doing is actually working. Just give it a little bit more time. So from the policy perspective, there might be a little bit more patience here, given that you could interpret recent results as bearing fruit. So it's not as if the Chinese authorities are urgently 
reacting to economic problems. Now they may actually be talking and directing their focus on real estate and banking, where some of the real problems, the more immediate problems lie. But there is no indication yet that we have any sort of banking and liquidity difficulties that would require a hyper intervention on the part of the PBOC and authorities. But there is, we should note, a lot of demand for gold coming from China itself. The Chinese seem to be souring on their real estate and looking for other ways to store their wealth, which historically that's what gold has been used for. We should note, as I mentioned in the introduction, that a lot of the other commodities like steel, steel is getting, cl is getting clobbered today over in China, despite these better than expected economic numbers, Steele says, yeah, okay, maybe, but the, the real estate situation seems to be getting worse. There's less building going on or less building likely to be going on than we thought before. In fact, steel prices are at their lowest since 2021, which is barely nearly the lowest since 2017 and falling further. And going with it, iron. Iron prices are declining too. Which key industrial commodities, along with silver, at least part of silver is industrial, suggesting that what, what's driving gold is specific to gold. Maybe it is fears that China's economy is going to continue to get worse as the real estate situation, as I said, further and further degrades. Not necessarily a response to it, a hyperinflationary response to it from Chinese authorities, but the situation itself. Steel prices argue for intractable economic and financial issues in the real estate sector, potentially holding down China's economy, which is itself enough of a danger to drive gold prices higher. As I've mentioned previously, especially in the recent video I did with Macro Elf, China remains the biggest risk there is. And there's every reason to believe that, especially since these other commodities aren't trading along with gold. The second general explanation you hear for the recent rise in gold prices is inflation. It's about to make a major comeback, according to quite so many people. In fact, you look at gold prices, they really started their recent surge at the end of February. So something happened in March that drove a substantial amount of demand, the substantial amount of financial hedging into the gold market. And there's a number of reasons, I mean, people talk about oil prices continuing to rise as well as recent consumer price numbers in the United States and some other places and suggest that all this disinflation talk, well, that's all transitory. We're back to, in some places, transitory disinflation. Another, we got more statistics today. The US ISM, for example, that came in better, much better than expected. In fact, the ISM was above 50 for the first time since October, 2022. But more importantly, in the context of this discussion, its prices index hit 55.8, which is its highest since July, 2022, stoking even more fears of this inflation comeback. So energy prices, some economic statistics, but recent, consumer price data itself does not argue for transitory disinflation. It continues to look very disinflationary. In fact, Friday, we got more from the BEA in the form of the PCE deflator, the numbers the Federal Reserve actually uses to judge inflation or consumer price stability. The PCE deflator was just 0.33% month over month in February, which is actually a little bit slower than in January. Um, the year-over-year -year rate was only two-tenths of a percent faster, 245 versus 243. So still sticking around very close to the Fed's target. The core rate, maybe more importantly, that one only increased by 0.26% month-over-month in February compared to 0.45% in January. So a substantial slowdown in the core rate in February. And the core year-over-year -year rate was 2.78%. So the recent numbers from the PC deflator, at least, suggest still disinflationary here. Now, what most people are saying is, yeah, okay, maybe that's the case. But with oil prices surging and the tight labor market and the U.S. economy that continues to move along, resilient and strong, that's only going to restart inflation pressures or price pressures in the months ahead. But when you look at some of the other macroeconomic statistics, like incomes, for example, Incomes continue to be exceptionally weak. In fact, last week, as the BEA reported on these price numbers, they also reported on their monthly income and spending statistics. 
And real disposable income it's just, is a number that we keep pointing out over and over again. That one fell again in February. It was down 0.11% in the month of February. It had basically unchanged in January. So this year starts out in terms of real income in the exact wrong way. Real DPI is up just 1.7% year over year and only six tenths of a percent over the last six months. Even nominal DPIs, I keep pointing out, that has continued to slow down. Just 0.24% month over month. And over the last three months, it's less, it's up less than 1%. Even real personal income, excluding transfer receipts, that one was negative in February too. So when you look at the income numbers, they don't argue for a tight labor market. They don't argue for a robust economy. If anything, they're pointing toward more weakness ahead. Whatever the individual fluctuations or the monthly fluctuations, the short-term fluctuations in the economy in the near term. Weak incomes, not a tight labor market, weak economy, therefore consumer prices, regardless of energy and oil, they're gonna to continue to be disinflationary. And besides, at the end of the day, gold isn't about this kind of inflation anyway, if, assuming this was inflation. It's not about a few tenths of a percent in consumer prices or even a few percentage points in consumer prices. Gold is about, as I said, the big error and there's no evidence that we're heading into something like the 1970s. Even though many people continue to hold out that that's the case, when all the evidence shows that's not the case. I think we can cross off a 1970s style inflation that is boosting gold prices here. And that brings us to the third major culprit or potential explanation for the gold price surge, especially when we consider, again, the timing of it, going back to late February, throughout March, and into now April. And that is banking fragility and, of course, commercial real estate. I mentioned a couple days ago in a video I did on European banks and what they're up to. They're lending to non-banks, which is consistent with disinflationary or even deflationary monetary circumstances and problems in the liquidity system across the euro dollar <clears throat> the problems in liquidity across the euro dollar system. We've also seen kind of interesting behavior in U.S. banks too. The recent statistics from the H8 survey, which is the Federal Reserve's data on commercial banks in the United States. Again, as I mentioned in a video last week, U.S. banks, huge decline in cash. Another one for the second week in a row, 70.4 billion in cash just disappeared. That was after 172.7 billion drop the week before. Now this is somewhat consistent with the March bottleneck and seasonality. We do see this at least in the last couple years where something happens in the banking statistics at the very least, which is likely picking up a fluctuation in the banks consistent with this post-March bottleneck or this mid-March bottleneck from the March 15th, the second half of the month of March, in 2021, in 2022, certainly in 2023, and now 2024. We don't necessarily see that in a big drop in cash, although that was this year as well as two years ago in March of 2022, but we see it more so as a residual where the level of assets over liabilities shrinks to a considerable deg degree. Assets over liabilities, that gap shrinks a huge amount in the second half of March. And in March of 2024, that gap shrunk by an enormous amount, almost 200 billion, primarily driven by this decrease in cash, which suggests there is something here, some kind of something that some kind of bank behavior that is leading to what we see in these numbers. And that bank behavior is consistent with these, the March bottleneck and is certainly the aftermath from it, which is not a positive sign. It's a signal of fragility in the banking system. That's what we're looking at here. And there's all sorts of other evidence for it, including just recently testimony before the Senate by Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve's chairman. When he was asked about commercial real estate, what he said was, yeah, we're expecting more banks are going to fail here. This is a problem we'll be working on for years more, I'm sure. There will be bank failures. It's not a first order issue for any of the very large banks. It's more smaller and medium sized banks that have these issues. We're working with them. We're getting through it. I think it's manageable is the word I would use. Now, while he says it's manageable, 
You hear the Federal Reserve chairman saying we're going to have some bank failures. You can understand why some people would think, yeah, you think it's manageable. What are the risks here? Maybe they're not manageable. While it appears to be, again, he, what he said was actually true. This is not an issue for the largest banks who have cleaned up their balance sheet. In fact, they've cleaned up too much. They have too much defensiveness on their balance sheet, which means, among other things, Credit Suisse was probably the exception, not the rule here. There's not going to be a large bank failure. It's going to be more about smaller and medium-sized uh, institutions, like Powell said. We all know that's the case. But that also entails large and substantial risks. And as the commercial real estate problem continues to grow bigger and bigger, whether or not it's above the surface, whether we can see it out from the shadows, that's a different story. But as the commercial real estate problem continues to grow, and we know there's going to, it's going to lead to some bank failures, that's potentially very messy. Not a trivial possibility either. So as we get closer and closer to the moment where some of these things actually have to happen, as we see the U.S. banking system behave in unusual ways, you can understand why there would be such an appeal to the financial hedge in gold. There was an update from a company called Commercial Edge. They put out their national office report for March of 2024, and it contained some pretty eye-opening statistics. They said the average U.S. office listing rate stood at just $37.83, which is down 1.2% year over year. So that's a decline there, as well as maybe the bigger one, the national office vacancy rate increased by 1.4 percentage points to 17.9%. As Commercial Edge stated, these challenges in the sector are exacerbated by higher interest rates and ongoing economic uncertainties that put pressure on upcoming maturing loans, their, U, their latest report shows. As Extend and Pretend moves into the next phase, we anticipate an increase in distress activity and discounted asset sales, especially if the asset is less desirable. So potential distress sales, fire sales, leading to liquidity issues. There are a number of risks that are happening right now. Despite the positive outlook that you see in the most of the mainstream media, GDP and everything else. Okay, so what we know is that gold is absolutely soaring, and it has been over the last four or five weeks here. One explanation is China. The China is about to ramp up their money printer and unleash an inflationary tidal wave all throughout the all throughout the world potentially. I don't think that's the case. I don't think many people actually believe that's the case. I think that some people in trying to explain gold price behavior, that's the one they're always going to come back to. That's a hyperinflationary thing. There are real risks in China that relate to the real estate as well as the real economy that could be driving gold prices, including demand for gold among Chinese themselves. A second explanation is a resurgence in inflation across the Western world, but the U.S. economy, especially income, does not really argue for that. Europe is a mess, and this economy is actually tanking even worse, more likely to be disinflationary or deflationary from Europe, as well as what we see in the United States as far as banks are concerned. And that's the final one. Banks are still cutting back on their loans. They're not doing anything risky. Plus, there's all this other funky stuff going on in their stats. And behind all of it, commercial real estate, which we know, everybody knows, is going to be a problem. And at the very least, it's going to keep a lid on their risky activities, which means not inflation, but a higher potential for not just bank failures, but actual substantial disruptions in the financial system as well as the economy. It doesn't necessarily mean 2008 Rio all over again, but substantial enough disruption and disorder that it becomes worth hedging with something like gold. Alfonso was back. Macro Alf stopped by Eurodollar University just a couple days ago. We talked about China and the definition of liquidity and how those two actually relate. That's the video linked below. Check out Eurodollar University's spring sale. As always, I thank you for joining. A huge thank you to Eurodollar University members and subscribers, especially all the new ones. And until next time, take care.